This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Nate Blyton. I'm Sam Mercier's. I'm Dave McDonald. And this week, we're happy to have back friend of the show, Drew McManus. Drew, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. So, friend of, of course, the show. I'm, friend of the show. Of course, Drew is the author and, uh, can I say, administrator of Adaptistration? Sure. That sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds good because you cover orchestra administration, and you're an administrator yourself. That's right. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're just making no, this really awkward. This way. is going really smoothly, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Patrick injects the awkward button. Um, <laughs> Ask him what his favorite color is, Patrick. <laughs> Drew, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be and why? Uh, hey, that's, that's my personality <laughs> that really shines through on the show. Yeah, okay. Blame so here. we 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 asked Drew to join us this morning because there has been a lot of uh, I'm going to go with shenanigans. There have been a lot of shenanigans um, in the orchestra world this fall. A lot of orchestras have um, been either not starting their fall seasons or starting their fall seasons uh, on tenuous footing um, due to contract negotiations, um, and we've seen. All, we've seen this at all levels of uh, the the orchestra budget world, from from very small regional and local orchestras to um, what I, this is one of my favorite lines from the classical music blogosphere in the last few months. Norman Lebrecht describing the Chicago Symphony as a luxury orchestra. Um, so from from things like Spokane, Washington, all the way up to the Chicago Symphony, um, is this unusual an unusually large amount of labor problem in the u.s or is it just being talked about more true both i think is a fair answer there uh, it, there certainly are in just pure quantity numbers far more orchestras going through these sorts of problems than normal um and it's getting more attention because of course with the rise of the culture blogosphere there's more people talking about it there's more people paying attention to it than just the traditional print media outlets. Okay, I'm going to call my next book "The Rise of the Cultural Blogosphere." That's that's a great <laughs> that's a great or at least a subtitle. Perhaps it, that that could be the subtitle, and I need some catchy something for the title. Anyway, um, I mentioned the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and and I know you're based in Chicago, and I don't want you to uh, I, put, I don't want to put you in a bad position, um, but. It's, it was really surprising to everyone. Was there was there any warning to anybody, even in Chicago, that something like this was going to happen? <laughs> um, unfortunately, I can't talk about Chicago because oh, okay. I have a conflict of interest. Okay, I, that's fair. The Chicago Symphony Orchestra uses one of the uh, services that I offer as a consultant, but otherwise I would be normally be happy to talk about any group that I don't have a conflict of interest with. That just unfortunately, timing-wise, happens to be at a point in time where people would like to talk about it. That's fine. Um, what we that s- actually makes us look like high rollers, the fact that our guests. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good for us. Thank you. Well, Hey, Drew, there's this really big orchestra in Illinois. <laughs> uh, we were wondering if you could... No, like, no, just joking. Hypothetically, <laughs> let's imagine that, that there's a large orchestra that's very famous, has a storied history. Actually, no, that's actually a, a funny thing. We could actually talk a little bit more broadly, because the, these budget problems are occurring at a larger level, I think, than than we're used to hearing them. We, we talked a lot last year, in particular, about the Philadelphia Orchestra, Um and obviously these are different situations, but they're not orchestras that you would have imagined being in, in or having these kinds of problems um, not very long ago. Is, is, is it just that um, the kind of decline of classical music attendance is starting to af- affect the, the, the larger groups last? Um, or is this a new thing? Well, it's good to probably have some perspective and parameters on this. Is sure. Economic troubles are not relegated to any one geographical region, not one type of budget size. It affects everyone from the smallest budget organization all the way up through the largest, regardless of where they are in the country and who's a part of the organization. 
it really has far more to do with the individual situation and variables inside every organization. There are some large budget groups that are doing just fine and not experiencing labor troubles, and there are those that are having substantially more trouble. Um, you'll notice that since the economic downturn, this is obviously not the first time there's been groups that have had troubles. Ever since 2008 hit, groups at varying degrees have been having different levels of crisis. It just so happens that I think we're seeing more groups now in this particular season because every group has a degree of buffer zone built into it, usually with uh, endowment funds or increased fundraising, where they're able to withstand the first couple of years of a major hit in any one of the three major revenue streams of earned income, like ticket sales, annual contributed income and large gifts, and investment income, which will usually be uh, investment payments off of an endowment the organization uh, owns and operates. And when one of those goes down too far and the other two aren't able to compensate for it, you'll end up in the kind of situations that are being defined as crisis today, where austerity measures have to be uh, introduced. So speak... You, you mentioned austerity measures, and it, a lot of times we we do, as you point out, tend to oversimplify these things. Um, that that you know the the is, that it's just about very simple issues like compensation. Like the the musicians want to earn more money, the orchestra wants to pay them less, um, and you have you started a really interesting series on adaptation this week, um, examining what's going on in Minnesota. Uh, with the, with the Minnesota Orchestra, and uh, a really interesting blog post. Everybody should check this out uh, on on Drew's website, uh, adaptation dot com. And um, you've gone into detail about specific, like one really specific thing, the 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 runout uh, issue. Um, so I'm wondering if for the, for those that haven't read uh, your your analysis of this Minnesota Orchestra proposal, if you could kind of give us a, a brief overview. Sure. <clears throat> and I think you've touched on one of the real issues that tends to get lost in traditional discussions is people do focus almost exclusively on compensation, base pay levels, uh, the weeks the orchestra performs, and then benefits, health care and retirement, as though none of the other issues really matter that much. But that couldn't be farther from the truth. In the case of the Minnesota Orchestra, we're fortunate in that um, there is a copy of what's called the redliner markup version of management's last offer to musicians, which is not just their language of a new contract, but it's also the language from the old contract that literally has a red strikeout through the areas that they want to change, which gives the one thing that people don't get in these situations, which is frame of reference. It's not just what they want, but what they're changing, and the obvious question after that is, why does it need to be changed? And the first issue we took a look at in this ongoing series was, you're correct, the runout and home area language, which is extensive in most organizations and varies due to an almost incalculable number of variables uh, for each individual group because it's so specifically generated toward that local community. Right. And, and the communities that they could run out to. Correct. Um, so um, this is a, a kind of a complicated issue, but um, what is the, uh, the, the obvious, there's an obvious benefit to the orchestra to having these runouts that they can, you know, sell tickets to new communities of people. Um, and, and when they go to these communities, especially those that are more distant, it's more of a special thing for those people to see a, a big time group like the Minnesota orchestra. Um, what is the downside to the musicians for these runouts other than the inconvenience of, you know, traveling a little bit further? Well, there's a couple of things and actually it's not really the musicians who necessarily have the biggest negatives involved. One of the things that people tend to overlook right now, especially with the whole outreach issue, is it isn't as simple as just saying we're going to play in remote location A that's different than what we normally do. 
you have to develop an audience, which is going to be a substantially higher marketing cost. So you, you're going to earn less for every dollar of ticket that you sell. Uh, there's also the issue of the quality of the venue. You can have the best possible orchestra, but if you take them out into one of the worst possible venues that sounds terrible, it just doesn't matter because people aren't going to get the impact of what that orchestra is. So you have a potential uh, degradation in artistic uh, product that you're actually going to be doing in the live setting. Uh, and then there's whether or not there can ever be a turnaround. And after you have your initial increase in marketing expenses, is it something that you can bring under control to make it worthwhile? You could actually end up in a scenario where doing the runout concerts produces less income and generates less contributed income even from individuals than if you had stayed in your home venue. There's an awful lot of research and development that has to go in to make a successful runout program. And that's the one thing that is a question mark with the Minnesota scenario. Is it just because it's popular to talk about runouts and outreach right now, they want to increase this range and change these rules? Or do they have a good bit of research that they've done to demonstrate, look, there's a lot of potential here. We're going to make a lot out of this if we just relax these rules. And, and is this something that, that they share? Do they share this kind of information with one another? This, uh, it, you know, If they've done this market research in, in, when they're putting this contract together, do they, do they say, see, we, 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 can sh we can demonstrate to you that this is a, a worthwhile endeavor? Usually. It's definitely not universal. It depends entirely on the people involved. You have a lot of things that boil down sometimes to as petty of issues as just personalities that can influence whether or not that information is shared. And if it is, do they share it in part or in whole? Do they allow the other side to be able to uh, look at the conditions under which the report was generated so they can do their own due diligence? But in an ideal situation, absolutely, managements and boards present these reports to musicians to let them know that you know they're not just tossing it out there. They really think there's a lot of potential. And those scenarios usually do turn around with some changes into whatever work rules they're looking at. And and so that's that's interesting that they're sharing that kind of information. And um, one of the things that I that that I was reading, I don't remember if I read this on Adaptation or somewhere else, is that uh, first of all, the not only is the Minnesota Orchestra locked out right now, they're neighbors the st paul orchestra are also locked out um and i don't know if there's any connection or if it's just a really unfortunate coincidence for the twin cities um but one, one of the reasons that the musicians uh have uh, an issue with management at the moment in these negotiations is that they aren't getting certain um financial records that that, that they would like to see from uh management i and i suppose they want to see if um the austerity uh, measures are um, overly steep. Um, is that is that a common complaint in these in these kinds of negotiations? Oh, very much so. And look, I think it's important for people to understand, especially about the Minneapolis scenario, where you have both the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra and the Minnesota Orchestra both being locked out. There's plenty of talk from a lot of people about the amount of collusion that goes in uh, to the timing of this. And the simple fact is both sides engage this practice. Musicians talk to each other, orchestra committees talk to one another to be able to gauge what's going on in their negotiations and to develop. But musicians uh, never talk track. to boards. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I was just joking. That, like musicians talk to one another, and board members talk to one another, but musicians never talk to board members, right? <laughs> <laughs> In some cases, that's true. <laughs> the top. So it, that that's just a good example in, in Minneapolis's case, where there's a lot of variables, and one of them is likely going to be the fact that they are located next to one another, and it wouldn't be surprising if there is communication on both sides between groups about how they're going to handle this moving forward. And that will influence the, the outcome of, of both particular situations. Um, one, one thing that we talk about in a lot of these, especially with the smaller market orchestras um, and smaller budget orchestras, 
one the of less the less luxurious orchestras, the less luxurious orchestras, the kind of econom, economy class orchestras. That sounds horrible. <laughs> I'm taking that back. Um, is these orchestras, and we we mentioned this with Orchestra Nova in San Diego a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the the orchestra wants to take the the model from a salaried orchestra to a per service orchestra, and um, that's that's never acceptable, obviously, to the musicians. Um, and I'm wondering if that if that's ever an okay thing to. Are there any circumstances in which that would be an acceptable thing i understand that it's it's a major change and it's 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 always going to be uh going to mean that the the musicians are getting less work and getting paid less uh but it also seems like as as audiences are shrinking that it's only reasonable that some orchestras won't be playing as much is that fair well it is and it's probably a little better to look at the situation as not just a distinguishment between uh, salary and per service because most of the smaller to mid mid-level size budget orchestras are going to have a hybrid of the two some of the musicians will be salaried some of them will be per service and on the per service side of it the next question to ask is do you have guaranteed numbers of services because it's yeah. very easy to turn around the situation and actually earn more as a per-service musician with guaranteed numbers of services as opposed to a salaried musician that's based on numbers of weeks with maximum services per week that they work. Well, so I guess in, in maybe, a, maybe a larger context, we've seen a lot of situations in which musicians uh, have accepted certain levels of austerity. Um with kind of the understanding that they would eventually work their way back to where they were and then hopefully even beyond where they were. Um, and it seems like th- I, I, with good reason, everyone's reluctant to just say, well, forget about it. We'll call it a day and f- find, find something else to do with our time. Um, but it, it seems like that's never, um, it, that's never thought of as a, as a reasonable alternative um, is to to make the organization actually smaller um, because it seems like these communities are at some point not going to be able to sustain them um, and and of course there's a lot that uh, orchestras can do to turn that around but often it feels like we're getting into that a little bit too late in the cycle um, to, to turn things around is that is that a reasonable observation? Or am I well, yes and no. So? There are orchestras that a long time ago, several decades ago, had a very large reputation, like Toledo. It was one of the founding members of Ixom, uh, the larger budget size uh, uh, affiliation of the American Federation of Musicians. But now they're a, a maybe lower, moderate size budget orchestra. They cut back considerably over time and have kind of remained in that middle level where they are now. And orchestras bounce back and forth over tiers more frequently than people think, actually. Uh, It just isn't on the top of their mind because of the numbers that are going on right now that are looking at those kind of uh, strata crossings, let's say. Right. And and also, it's not quite it's not quite as as uh, not quite as sexy as an orchestra walking out and picketing their their fancy orchestra concert halls. Right. But I think what you talked about before is the point that most people tend to miss with this, which is the way that uh, contracts and strategic planning works in this business is the only way that one of the stakeholder groups, the art, the artistic side, the musicians, can influence strategic decision making in the organization is through the collective bargaining agreement, because that's a legally enforceable document. Otherwise, it's just the graces of management and the executives. If you've got a great, uh, I'm sorry, the board and the executives. If you've got a great board and great executive, they're going to do great things regardless of what's in the collective bargaining agreement. They're going to grow the orchestra and maximize potential. And there's not going to be a lot of trouble. That's not always the situation. And the big move when people are really talking about wanting to change, quote unquote, the model, is shifting away from a planned expense structure that 
just maybe between one and three years in the future, as opposed to moving to determining what next year's expenses are based on the current year's receipts. Okay. Um, so that actually determining like, that kind of planning um, reminds me of, of, of something else that I wanted to ask you about. Um, a couple of orchestras we've talked about recently have um, gone, instead of striking or locking out, um, have kind of had these interim play and talk deals. Um, in, Seattle has has taken that, uh, just literally taking their current contract and extending it through the end of January. Um, and Indianapolis has this kind of interesting hybrid uh, situation um, where, and correct me if I'm getting this wrong, they, they have uh, a kind of a, a bridge deal that will get them through February 2013, this coming February. And if the orchestra has raised a certain amount of money by that day, another four and a half year contract will come in. It's not, not up till 2017. Um, and if not, who knows? Is that sequestration? Say what? Sequestration. If they don't make it, I don't know exactly. Uh, is that, is that, is that what's happening in Indianapolis, Drew? That's a really good question. And Indianapolis is a very unusual settlement because it contains those contingency triggers. Um, I haven't seen a copy of the final agreement, but I've seen pieces of it. And I've had some good conversations with the local music critic, Jay Harvey, who I, I think has seen a copy of it. And it appears that if they don't reach that fundraising goal, what happens is the remainder of the contract is null and void and both sides enter into the traditional bargaining cycle again. That sounds really complicated. <laughs> well, it, it certainly is. I think there's nothing wrong with coming up with unusual situations like this. No, I, I like the creativity. Thing, right. Well, and that's one of the things that people tend to forget is contracts are also about far more than just settling terms. There's a lot of personality and reputation that goes into this. The Seattle situation is a great example where the musicians came out, said we took a strike authorization vote, it passed, so the committee can strike at any time they want to, to help relieve some pressure and also allow both sides an opportunity to save face, both publicly and internally. They went ahead with the prescribed play and talk by means of the extension of the previous contract. But it's that saving face element that people tend to overlook when thinking about how these final agreements go into place is how does that allow both sides to emerge from a contentious scenario where they were both likely lobbing insults and beating each other up in the press and trying to make each other look bad. Yeah. Um, it, one, one thing that I, I kind of like uh, about what I, my understanding of the, the Indianapolis deal is that it has this kind of test period where, where they're going to see, you know, is, is the kind of growth that we're hoping for something that we can actually achieve? Um, and, and it's kind of aspirational in that, in that regard. They're saying, you know, we hope we can be able to do this. So we're going to, tr we're going to see if we can make these goals to, to, to do this level of competition f for a few months. And if, if it works, fantastic and we'll keep doing something similar and uh if not we need to find something else um i wonder with the seattle uh extension in these plain talk agreements um if and, and while you say, you say saving face is important and i and i think you're you're absolutely right and we i a few weeks ago i i kind of compared it to um professional athletes striking when when you read when normal people read news about you know people in tuxedos on strike that doesn't sit very well with a lot of people um and uh that's i think pretty understandable but um i wonder with something like the the seattle play and talk deal if that takes away from the uh immediacy the impetus to to make an agreement in in the meanwhile if if you're losing something there in the negotiations. Oh, absolutely. Um, San Antonio is maybe a good example of that this last year, where right. 
they had ostensibly a year-long planned talk that got to a point to where the musicians, which is, this is unusual from a historical perspective, were starting to really push hard toward getting the negotiations going again and had to actually file an unfair labor charge against management in order to kind of kickstart the agreement to get it going. But at least the happy news is they came to an agreement in very short order. Well, um, so uh, what what I what I'm wondering is if if there's um, a a point at which I a, a few I think last week I compared it to uh, the budget deals in U.S. Congress where they keep yeah. putting on these continuing resolutions and then we'll we'll agree on a budget later and we'll just kind of continue what we're doing now. Um, so eventually there's going to be the shutdown, um, where we, where we fall off the fiscal cliff, right? Um, what were you going to say something, Sam? No, I'm just like this to me, that's what I've been thinking the whole time. It sounds exactly like, and, and not for dissimilar reasons. Certainly the government stopping operation is different than an orchestra stopping operation, but there's also a face saving value, you know, because of the party system. When you're trying to come to a budget resolution, it's always a face saving operation between the two parties over how it's going to happen you know um i think that's inevitable and and well you could say that uh, labor and management in a in an orchestra forms a two-party system also maybe um <clears throat> drew i had a question about um uh you mentioned personalities being a factor in in these uh disputes and in these in the negotiations and I was thinking about that, but then it led me to think, you know, it, this seems like a very unique business model, an orchestra in and of itself, because of who the labor is and how you, the people you have to hire to be the labor and the kinds of people those are and the way the administration works and how they get the revenue and how it's not, it's not like I think about auto companies a lot, but it's not really the same. I mean, it's pensions and labor and all that, but a lot of other stuff is very different. So do you think that the orchestra is sort of a unique business model? Oh, no doubt. And I'm glad to hear you guys actually start to make this uh, federal government connection with governance of the country and the governance model that's in place with most orchestras. I make this comparison a lot, actually. Uh, one of the analogies that you can use with this is that applies equally to federal government is it's like imagining a divorce process where both sides know they're going to end up sleeping with each other afterwards in the same bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, well. That's 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 pretty interesting. <laughs> well, that's really I have what no happened. response for that. And Sounds in the end, um, on the federal government side, you see people who know how to make deals and play games. And to a degree, it's very much the same on the orchestra side. And for decades and decades, both sides have pushed how far they can play that game. In the here and now, that scenario is changing a bit. Because you see both sides, at least on the board side of things, starting to move toward a new game of chicken that's never existed before. Where if they're willing to move the organization past a point where both sides never really would have gone before, then it leaves the other side in a real quandary. How do you deal with that? If you don't have the traditional face-saving mechanisms, if you don't have something in place that allows both parties to move forward, even if it's a closed-door agreement to remove key players from the scenario, uh, then it creates an increased level of conflict, which I think is representative in a number of the, of the labor disputes going on right now. Well, um, that's that's an interesting thing. We, we, we have uh, some stories in the doc today about, uh, about politics and, um, and classical music. Uh, perhaps the little, leading little. the leading political article is a uh, an actual um, poll that Drew posted on adaptistration dot com. Uh, Drew, do you have a, a current count for us of uh, the opinion poll? And the maybe you could tell us what what made you put that there and and sure. what it is. Sure, sure, sure. Um, it's actually one of the blog posts I like doing the most because it took me maybe three minutes to do. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> and generated and came out an of a interesting conversation, conversation. That just I had with a colleague. And we were talking about the national election, uh, not just the presidential, but everyone's respective elections that goes along with it. And mm -hmm. how important did we really think the arts and arts education funding had 
on any given individual's decision to who they were going to vote for. And of course, you can have this discussion inside the business and people who are already inclined to you know, working in or having a vested interest in some sort of performing art or culture related business are probably going to have a higher degree of interest. But I also run into a lot of realists in the business that when they look at, especially the national election, the presidential election, they do look at all the other issues and those are just as critical to them as well. So I wanted to find out where people really were on this issue, at least in our field. Would, and you, the would you mind sharing asked, where you are? <laughs> <laughs> not just Chicago, where we can vote early and vote often, but the rest. <laughs> but the question I asked was, how important is a candidate's position on arts and arts education funding in your voting decision? Very important, important, somewhat important, or not important. And so far, it's running 48% for very important, 21% for important, 20% for somewhat important, and only 12% for not important. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's a little bit of a surprise. I thought it would be a little heavier weighted toward the middle than like this. Especially well, with such a self-selecting audience as readers of Adaptistration, um, you would think that would be... I, I mean, I'm thinking of... I was watching... Uh, caught a little bit of the Ed Schultz show on uh, MSNBC this week and his poll, he has these ridiculous polls. Like, I, I think the one I, I, I'm thinking of was, is, can Mitt Romney win Pennsylvania without lying or something like that? And of course, the <laughs> MSNBC audience is like 93% no or well, something. That proves it. <laughs> Say no, what? That proves it, right? Exactly, right? So I mean, I'm surprised that the, the, your your audience for Adaptistration was not more gung-ho about um, the the cultural positions of their politicians. Um, I think I, I care a little bit, um, but there are a lot of other things that... I guess it probably would might depend on what what kind of what what office we're we're talking about, but it, it seems a little bit myopic to me to pick a president based on what they're going to do with the point zero zero one percent of the federal budget that goes to the arts and and even if they even if they you know increased it by ten times to point zero one percent of the federal budget, that's still such a such a tiny thing for for uh the arts community that and 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 we've talked about this before that that, that maybe we need to not be relying on those so as, as much anyway um it seems a little bit small ball uh, to, to use the the word that gets tossed around for some other issues in politics yes however um, I still think it's, I mean, everybody kind of runs that calculus in their mind when they read this question to me, you know, you obviously, I, I don't, Im, I don't imply by the question that my decision is going to be based solely on my, what this, you know, this is, in other words, the context is contained within the question. You know what I mean? Right. I understand. I understand within the saying. context of how important it is in the federal budget, but I put uh, important, I didn't put uh, very important. Because I think the important and somewhat important are kind of exactly the same thing in this context. But uh, it's interesting to me to see what people said because this is such a limited uh, set of respondents, you know, a very particular, because most of the time this kind of thing is pointless. But right. This is actually <laughs> very interesting. But, um, you know, Sam, you and me, we're, we're crazy lefties anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's it's just kind of a, a side thing for all the other, I mean, that, that's, that's the side that's going to support the arts, but that's not really the main reason that we vote with them. Well, you know, the arts have been talked about just about as much as global warming has in the race thus far. So. Right. And, and just, education. Yeah. Well, no, Obama pivots from everything to education. Well, only, you know? only higher ed though. Not, not anything below higher ed. He's just talking about college degrees. Most of the time, he's yeah. not talking about public schools. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's not speak, the point. We're not, this is not a politics show. Yes, yes. Well, it is a politics show, and I'll tell you okay. why. Tell me. Because the lamestream uh, classical music media... <laughs> oh, Jesus. Nah, I'm just kidding. It's not that serious. But people are, making a, <laughs> people are making a deal over a premiere of a new Beethoven work. Beethoven? I'll have to say... 
I've admitted the last time we had this kind of thing that I admitted I wasn't as cynical as I might have been because I was a Brahms fan when they had the Brahms thing. So I'm going to just say I'm going to Romney myself, and I'm going to be way more cynical this time because I'm not a Beethoven fan. You got it, Dave? I got, I got, I'm picking up what you're laying down, Sam. Um, <laughs> I, I, so that some people are excited about this does not surprise me. And, and we should say that this is not a new composition by Beethoven, this is a hymn setting. This is essentially an arrangement of uh, a, a plain song. And I think it's just like a harmonization for piano or something. Yeah. Um, when we're all famous, this, this all is of our not, music this homework is, is going to be just as important as this. Right. This is not your 10th symphony <laughs> sketch. This is essentially a study that would have been done probably when he was very young. Um I cannot believe that it is is so important as to be covered by the major wire services. We yeah. we we have a link that we'll have in the show notes to a Reuters article about this. Like I understand there's like some journal of of Beethoven minutia that might have an article about this next quarter or whenever they they publish. Um but the idea that this is something that is is reasonable for Reuters to cover kind of blows my mind. It's some, such some... a minor thing, and and it's just because it's it's Beethoven. If it were even someone of the same time period that was not kind of top forty classical music, this would not be an issue. We would not be talking about this. But the most interesting thing to me about this is if we we're all music people, we've been to music school, and this went down at Manchester University in Northern England, you know. So it's some early music music theory geek who was doing research and found this thing and wrote it out for some instruments. And, you know, it was probably, you know, it was like faculty and some other people showed up and they played it. And there was some light clapping and then a bunch of people talking geeky about Beethoven afterwards. I guarantee you. But Reuters carries it, you know. Right. It's having the Campus Composers concert from MSU carried by Reuters. And and without a link... Which is kind of one of my favorite parts of this. Alex Ross mentions on on his Rest is Noise blog this week. He's got a, a one sentence blog post uh, called "Old Complaint, No Links, No Explanation." Uh, wouldn't it be great if the media were covering significant new works by living composers instead of reporting the discovery of an exceedingly minor piece by Beethoven? Yes. While we're totally with you, it's never going to happen, and we're totally okay with that. Now. <laughs> Having said all that, I I've still made my peace with irrelevance. I still wouldn't <laughs> mind hearing it after all that. Really? Who wouldn't want to hear it? You know. I, I guess now that I've talked about it for five minutes, I kind of do want to hear it. Exactly right. Um, <laughs> God dang it! The thing is, imagine Reuters! how people. Uh, well, anyway, let's move it along. That's, let's that's do it. That more than it we spend enough time with that. Um. So the in the in the news this week, Billboard is wallowing in its own irrelevance. That's my paraphrase. You're, okay. <laughs> can can you give us a little more detail? <laughs> well, um, Billboard has re redone the calculus for how they d- determine their top 100 chart, which is like their most, you know, noted. It's like the chart as right, far as right. that goes for for the music industry. Okay. And uh, they've recalculated, and in the past it didn't include digital downloads, which seems redonkulous, doesn't it? Well, it didn't in the 90s. Yes. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, they've, they've redone this, and it's had a pretty big effect on how things happen. Um, for <laughs> the example they use in this article, it's a New York Times article that uh, Gangnam Style, which God, I, I'm sure everybody's heard at least a mention of it by now. Drew, do you know this? I've seen the Romney version, but I've never seen the original. Oh, you got to see the original. Oh, it's good. Yeah. It's good stuff. This <laughs> is like it, the, it, one, of, one of the best YouTube music videos. Um, have, and it's inspired this like bizarre flurry of interest in Korean pop music in the U.S. So, Kate, I'm telling you, you feel ahead. a surge, an equal surge to desire to make fun of it with an, equal, an equally powerful urge to go. That's kind of catchy. <laughs> Yeah, go try the dance. It's good parody, yeah, it's it's good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it anyway. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Gangnam Style. 
Um, but some people are upset about this. About this. About including. I'm surprised that they weren't including digital numbers already because they, their their figures are already based on sales numbers from Nielsen SoundScan, which does track digital downloads and has for ten years or more. The, I, I uh, this this kind of blows my mind that this was not included in 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 Billboard charts before. Well. The reason why I wanted to talk about this is the bigger issue of, of like the whole idea of centralized um, listing of popularity. What service? What what purpose does that serve now? To, because this is really just to be told something. What to what's think. that? People like to be told what to think. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but you know, it, in the most sort of uh, sort of holistic terms, I think the internet and the way. Um, search works you know sort of democratizes the process of deciding what's popular and what's not popular right right yeah, right that, that's so that's what i wonder is who checks this who looks at billboard except days. for terrestrial radio well, exactly. well i don't know if search is is it as much as social oh. is it yeah but you know what i mean i was including i said search to to include the broadest sense of you know how links economy and all that stuff works Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. But anyway, I don't know. Just like the whole idea, of, like centralized awards. You know, I rail against the idea of like centralized system of awards of the best. And this is sort of the same thing. You know, it's figuring out a way to uh, make a pecking order, and and it's just like a scorekeeping system for a method of distribution that I'm hoping is on its way out. So, so speaking of lists. <laughs> Speaking of lists, Rob, 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 a friend of the show, Rob, made another one, and he should really know by now that you get you only get in trouble when you make lists of things. Um, you know who else made lists of things? Um, and he is 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 trying to compile a list of composers to recommend to to uh, young composers to listen to, right? Well, he was considering the idea of making that sort of list. Okay, okay. but but we'll note that this time he has learned his fr from his past mistakes and not actually made the list. Correct. Um, Although he did include a list by friend of the show, Augusta Thomas. Thomas. Sure. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't know if if there's a lot to say here. What do you guys? Wh wh who would be on your list, Sam? Well, to me, it, I thought it was an interesting question because this is sort of the way um, it's always been done. You know, this is the way it's always been done. Uh, you you learn by getting suggestions from people whose opinion you respect, you know, uh, in one way or another. Okay. The big okay. difference to me these days and why I thought this was so interesting is when I looked at this list, I'm like, so if you go back to 1992 and I'm an undergraduate and somebody hands me this list – this list is a bunch of names that I can find some stuff about, but it's 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 like the beginning of a long journey. Now, if you give me this list now, it's like it's actionable intel. I can go and listen to all of that in a matter of an hour. I can hear a right, piece right. of all of that. Um, that was the interesting thing to me when I thought about this process of suggesting composers for your students, how much of a, how different a process it is now than perhaps when that list was made, you know? And one thing that's tricky is, is judging which of those go in the list um, based on how long they've been around. Uh, just, you know, perusing the, the, the list of, uh, from, from Jennifer Higdon that is on this article, they're all, I, I mean, many of them are still alive and still writing, but uh, some of them aren't, and uh, there aren't, I don't think, any on here that are under 40 or 50 years old. Um, so I'm wondering if it's, is it okay to include newer composers on a list like this? I or think do you have to wait until there is some sort of, I don't know, cultural gravitas to the their... Um, longevity. No, Sam. I think that hopefully the situation would be that the composers that are more contemporary that that you might encourage them to listen to, 
the information about who those might be would be something you leverage from your interaction with that composer. Or you know by, what I mean? Or by listening to Sound Notion. Or by listening to Sound Notion. <laughs> there you um, go. You know, the comments a lot of people make is it's it's student specific, and I agree with that. But something I think that is is ignored is a lot of students don't know. It, like for instance, if I were doing teaching composition lessons to a music uh, ed major who was taking a semester of composition lessons, I would make sure they knew the greatest hits. Yeah. Bang, yeah. you know, Stravinsky. I was just going to say, <laughs> Stravinsky is not on this list. I and know. I know <laughs> that I've taught students who don't know any Stravinsky or, or think they majors. don't know any Stravinsky for music that matter. Music majors. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not, I'm the last person to so, sort of sanctify the canon and say that's what we do. This is a, just a practical matter, you know. If you can't talk about some Stravinsky and Bartok and just the, the the big, 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 big people that sort of are used to, as the leverage points for discussing everything else, at least at the beginning, you're going to be lost. And and if you hear and if you hear those guys and you and you dig them, then you dig further in and you 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 drill down. Um, but like you said, you gotta you gotta at least know you know the the Stravinsky ballets and chamber music and the the big orchestral Bartok things and the string quartets. Um, and, and if you like them, you'll, you'll dig in and get more stuff. And I think that's the case with all of these things. We, we kind of get this, um, uh, surface level understanding on, on the, on the widest cult with the widest cultural lens. And then we find the things that we think really speak to us. And that's where, uh, I think Sam, you mentioned making a, a list specific to each student, mm -hmm. um, well, people and, that commented and, and, also, and, and I think that's that's something that that you do, and also specific to each piece. I know when I was teaching composition, when a student would come in and say, "I want to write, you know, a, a piece for clarinet," I would send them off first. The first round was listen to a bunch of clarinet music, and then we kind of expand from there. But it it seems like. The, that while there is this kind of general base of knowledge that we as people who operate in culture and who consider ourselves composers should have, there are also a lot more specific things. Um, so, yeah. so I, I think we can leave it there. Is that, is that reasonable? Anybody, any, anybody going to be upset if we drop this? Well, and I would also force all students to listen to Radiohead, of course. Of course. Of course you would. And that's actually maybe something we should talk about before we drop it, is that there's no popular music on this. Yeah. We talked to um, uh, Alexander Gardner a few weeks ago, who was doing uh, a, a collaboration with the Seattle Symphony Orchestra and Alan White, the drummer of 70s prog rock band, yes. Sonic Evolution Pro. Pro, Pro. For the Sonic. And I think that premiere was actually just this past Friday, if I yeah. am counting numbers correctly. Um, so it, we all knew a little bit. I knew a very little bit. You and Nate knew a lot more about yes. Um, and I'm wondering if that's something that is a, a reasonable thing for a composer in 2012 to, to know, um, the, the, the greatest hits, so to speak of popular music of the last, you know, 50 to 60 years, you know, is, is it, is it, is it's certainly, it's important to know Kurtag, Ligeti, Takamitsu, Berio, uh, and, and so on, but is it just as important to know Yes and the Beatles? Well, depends on what your goals are, I guess. Well, what do you? Why does it depend? Well, is I mean, it okay what, for somebody who considers themselves a composer to be completely ignorant of this music? I think well, I mean, not. <laughs> I and I say that as weird. someone who is mostly ignorant of this music. <laughs> so, how do you live with yourself, Dave? <laughs> a question I'm asked on a nearly daily basis. <laughs> I mean, there, there's just such an incredible no amount of music out there. It's hard to get to all of it. Like, my list would be very different, where of all this uh, crossover uh, jazz, full classical stuff, and there's, there's an incredible depth to that whole library of, and catalog of music that, um, and, and you learn a whole different set of things from it that goes into making a, a really different kind of collaborative music than what we would get from uh, this list by Augusta Reed Thomas as well. And, I mean, and I don't think that's, that it's bad, and certainly you can uh, 
cross apply and and do all that stuff and uh as far as like one list to give to your undergrad student to listen to this week <laughs> right but yeah and and i think the idea of making a list is and we've talked about this before kind of punting on the idea that there's just a lot of stuff out there and it's just going to take you a lot of time and you just need to continue to work on it all all, all the time yeah, and there's stay and open. there's and as as you just pointed out there's too much like it's you're going to have to give up on the idea that you can listen to everything like that's that's not possible you need to triage and at, at least not right now anyway what do you mean the idea of staying open and continuing to look that's that sounds valuable to me Right. Yeah. I'd say for someone who's expected to perform in academia, you know, I would suggest read and listen to music suggested in uh, 20th Century Music. I looked at it to make sure I had his name, Robert P. Morgan. If you, I mean, it is just a very sort of like, it gives you the, the big headliners and it'll say Stravinsky early, Stravinsky late, you know. I mean, it's, right, it's, right musicologists will argue with how shallow that is or whatever, but as far as the way that your understanding is supposed to operate just to get through school, it hits all the high points, you know? Yeah. If you want to operate in the musical world and uh, <laughs> perform in other contexts and things, then your list would be very different, I think. Yeah. Right. right. So we're, we're running a little long. Uh, I'd like to move on to the pick of the week, if that's all right with everyone. Sounds good. Um, uh, the pick of the week. So, Sam, you've been frozen for me for a long time, so we didn't see you do anything crazy there. But I like the whisper. <laughs> that was a nice touch. The whisper a strange was, was a very glance. nice touch. Thank you. You're, you've been frozen for me for, like, more than half the show now, too. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, thanks, Drew, for not being frozen. <laughs> yes. That's, that's why we have pros like Drew on the show, because he can move his head left and right and up and down and talk pretty good, too. <laughs> this week we're actually featuring something new, and I don't know why we haven't considered doing this in the past. We're we're featuring our new pick of the week uh, uh, memorial chimera, where the pick of the week combines with an honorarium to a a fallen composer. So, so this past week, uh, we we, we is actually just a few days ago on I think the twenty seventh. Uh, German composer Hans Werner Henze died. Um, and he was, if you're not familiar with his music, he was a very prolific composer. Um, he wrote a lot of music with kind of social consciousness in mind. Very political, actually. Um, and he, he wrote several operas recently that were, that were very important and a lot of symphonies. And when we were looking for a piece to use as our pick of the week, um, we had a lot to go through. And I thought about using a symphony, um, but I feel like a lot of people know his symphonies pretty well. And I wanted to maybe bring to your attention something that even if you know the music of Henze, you may, you may not have heard before. And so this is um, a violin concerto, his second violin concerto, which is a really interesting piece. It is not just, you'll, you'll hear the solo violinist, um, but you'll also hear a bass baritone vocalist and tape, and it's in it's a chamber ensemble. And sometimes, if you didn't know any better, you would almost think that this, this might be a piano concert as well. The piano is very prominent, particularly in, in this section that we're going to listen to. Um, so I want to play just uh, an excerpt from the first movement of Hans Werner Henze's second violin concerto.
So that was an excerpt from the second violin concerto of Hans Werner Henze, who passed away this week at age 86 uh, in Dresden, Germany, uh, where I believe he was actually uh, in in preparations for staging uh, one of his operas. So um, a a very cool piece. You heard just a little bit of the the vocalist there at the end. Um, So if you've you've not listened to a lot of Henze before... um, you should certainly check out this piece. We'll link to this and, and maybe one or two others. You can find his stuff all over the place. He's a, v- a very important European composer. And we've talked about before how in the U.S. we tend to overlook a lot of great European composers. And, and we c- c- see a little bit of the of the reverse as well, um, where some of the great American composers of today are a little bit overlooked uh, by European audiences. Um, so... Take a little bit of time this week and do your part to erase some of that that ignorance of these these great European composers. Uh, Norman Lebrecht. This two Lebrecht quotes in one week. That's I don't know what that says about our show. It's a sign um, of the end times. <laughs> yeah, uh, he he called Henze the the greatest post war German composer. So he's somebody that you should know. Um, and I think we should probably leave it there. Do you guys have anything you want to say about this piece? I don't. I didn't mean to run over the talking time. Well, way to, way to go. Way to not have any violin in the violin. The excerpt for the violin concerto day. <laughs> it's like almost the whole first movement. Well, the first movement is no violin. Whatsoever. I know because that is really exciting really? and cool, though. I know, and I love that, and I'm glad you played that part because that that crawling contrapuntal brass part where all the it's like a pile of brass instruments trying to make the way up their tessitura. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That yeah. Part, I, I, that's I, awesome. I really I love really, the, the, there's the, a lot of very, very like well-studied, well-studied traditional tradi- German, German counterpoint German. In, in, in a lot of Hens' music that I really, really love. Um, uh, in, in, there's we'll a see. moment. Go ahead, uh, go ahead. There's a moment in the movement after that one, I think, where it breaks out into sort of like a serenade accompaniment thing on the piano that sounds sort of normal. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Cool. And, 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 and maybe we should maybe link to the the other piece yes, that we were considering for the pick of the week, of the week as well, the Seventh well, Symphony, Symphony, which sure. is, which is relatively is, well known. Um, but uh, it's still something that you should absolutely listen to. It it has some of that great counterpoint as well. Um, Nate, do you have anything you want to add, or or uh, Drew for that matter? Matter? No, no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sam, could you mute your audio for audio? Or your mic getting a lot of feedback um but drew first of all i just want to thank you so much for for coming on the show uh you we we ask you on from time to time to set us straight about all this stuff in the orchestra world and you we're we're grateful every time that you do thanks it's always a lot of fun to be here people that have uh been watching the show for a while if you at home have been watching the show for a while you've seen drew many times you may not know that drew was one of our very first guests that we had on we're, this is i think episode 90 is that the case that's this, right so this, we've done a lot of these uh and i think the first one you were on drew was less than 20 um and you, you've just been so supportive of of us from the beginning and we really appreciate that well, the kudos all go to you guys. I think I remember mentioning after that very first show, what you're doing really is spectacular. It opens up a great forum to discuss such a wide range of particular topics inside the field. And that there's just no sense that questions can't be asked here, I think is what's really most valuable. Well, that, that means a lot that, that you say that. Thank, thank you so much for being on the show. If you're watching this at home and you've not read any of Drew's stuff, you should absolutely go over to adaptistration.com and check it out. And he's got a whole empire of adaptistration <laughs> things and uh, r- related uh, blogs, and they're, they're all worth your time. And you should, in particular, I, I, I would commend to you this, this series that he just started on the Minnesota Orchestra. Do you have anything you want to plug that's coming up? Drew? Uh, Coming up in the blog, well, there'll be more uh, articles in that series. We don't know how long it's going to go, but we're going to try to hit as many individual markout items in that agreement as possible, and there are quite a few, so this could go on for some time. And it's really fascinating that you have that red line. That's great. 
It's unusual to say the least, and even more unusual is that both sides in the conflict have confirmed that it is the accurate and complete document. Wow. Well, we will we will stay tuned for the thrilling conclusion uh, on adaptation dot com. Um, that's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. Thank you so much to everybody who was was watching live and joining us in chat. We, we apologize. Pa Patrick had some technical difficulties and had to, to leave us. You'll note that we started with four up here on the screen, and, and we're down to just three. So, A tough uh, day on Sound Notion. Apologies to, to everyone who, who tuned in just to hear Patrick's thoughts on uh, Billboard's recalculation. Um, speaking of billboards recalculation, if you would like to hear uh, any more about these things or read these articles that we were talking about, you can do that and more on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. You can leave, a, leave us a comment there if you have any of your own thoughts on politics and classical music. And if you support Valerie Gurgiev's uh, endorsement of Vladimir Putin in the Russian presidential election this summer... We'd love to hear about it. Um, you can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. We're at Sound Notion. We're also all individually on Twitter, and we'd love to continue this conversation with you there. Um, if you'd like to support the show, a lot of times people ask us how they can support the show, and um, you can go to our site, and there's a donation thing on the right side, but perhaps an easier thing, and certainly easier on, on your wallet, is next time you're buying anything on Amazon, use the little search uh, widget that we have on our site and we get a little commission and it doesn't cost you anything. So when you're doing your Christmas shopping on Amazon, like I do, and I assume a, a, a lot of other people are going to be doing uh, in the next few months, just use that and, and it'll, it'll not cost you anything and it'll help us out a lot. So we thank everybody who's done that so far uh, and would encourage everyone to continue doing that. Uh, this show and all our shows are available for free in the iTunes store, so go there and subscribe and have every episode downloaded automatically for you. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by our long-lost pal, Patrick Gulo, and video by Tyler Love. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you back next week. Don't boo, vote.